Hello, my name is Rhys Taylor. I'm a barrister at 36 Family and I'm joined by my colleagues uh, Andre Bajarski and Nikki Langridge uh, to talk through some of the issues relating to the coronavirus uh, pandemic and how it's going to affect uh, financial remedies uh, practice. What we thought we'd do is break uh, our talks down into little sessions and in this session we would like to uh, briefly talk about the uh, jurisdiction uh, known as the Thwaite and Thwaite jurisdiction. There'll be a number of uh, cases which have been decided in the last uh, year or so, perhaps even longer ago, that had um, certain assumptions uh, that fed into the way in which the case was settled or adjudicated. And the uh, crisis may well have now undermined um, those assumptions. And uh, if the order is yet to be fully implemented, um, in legal speak, it's still executory. Um, there is an argument um, in Thwaite that you're able to go back and have another look. So, Andre, could you tell us about it, please? Yeah, um, the Thwaite jurisdiction is probably not the best known uh, amongst family lawyers, and, and it's fairly rarely used. And it's, I, th I think it's fair to say it's got a little bit of controversy attached around it. So, as you say, it applies to executory orders, and an executory order is, as you've explained, an order that is still awaiting execution, an order that hasn't yet been implemented. Um, and the reason it's partly controversial as a jurisdiction is because it obviously flies in the face of the, the usual finality around orders that applies and the limited scope for variation of orders, which is usually that which is set out in Section 31 of the Matrimonial Causes Act, or those rare cases where there's a barter appeal out of time because of change of circumstances, or a appeal, or rather a setting aside on the basis of fraud or non-disclosure on Charland or Gohill grounds. Uh, we might just sort of mention some of that controversy a little bit later on in this talk. But the, the, the main jurisdiction comes from the case of Thwaite and Thwaite back in 1981 in the Court of Appeal. In brief terms, it was a case where an order for the transfer of a property was made for, for the property to be transferred from the husband to the wife on the basis that the wife was going to return from Australia with the children to live in that property in England. As it happened, she didn't return with the children. The husband felt that she'd reneged on her deal and he went back to court to try and have the orders set aside and varied on the basis that there had been those change of circumstances. The wife, on the other hand, applied to have the order implemented. And at first instance, she was successful. On appeal, the circuit judge uh, declined her uh, approach to it and took the view that he could look at the order again. That was again appealed. And the Court of Appeal took the view that although uh, the judge was right that he couldn't vary the order under Section 31 because it wasn't within uh, the scope of variable orders, uh, the court did have the power to refuse uh, to enforce an executory order. But beyond that, it went even further. And I, probably the best thing for me to do is just to read from paragraph three of the head note, where uh, what's said to have been the decision of the Court of Appeal was that although the judge was in error in considering that he had jurisdiction to vary the consent order under the liberty to apply, he had jurisdiction to hear the husband's appeal against the consent order and set it aside on the basis of the fresh evidence that the wife had no intention to make a home for herself and the children in this country. The judge also had jurisdiction to make the orders for ancillary relief despite the wife's refusal to consent to such a course because her original application for ancillary relief was still before the cause and awaiting adjudication. So read in those terms, it sounds a little bit like the Bada jurisdiction, uh, but it's not really quite the same thing as Bada, is it, Nikki? No, um, there's a quite fundamental differences between it. And I think one of the key uh, distingu distinguishing features is that uh, you're not necessarily looking for a new event uh, and you're not necessarily looking for something uh, that has happened very soon after the original order. And in fact, actually, I think in all the cases uh, that I can think of, there's actually been some significant delay, in fact, that's, that's triggered and enabled the court to exercise its jurisdiction. And so it's really difficult at the moment because there's been uh, several cases in, in the course of 2017 and 2018 where there was a little bit of tension, a bit of conflict between uh, certainly two judges in the High Court. Uh, but the Court of Appeal uh, have said quite clearly that this jurisdiction does exist and, and Lord Justice McFarlane as he then was, was very, very clear when he was listing the uh, factors that one could set aside, the basis on which one could set aside an order. Uh, he listed and include the fact that the uh, order is executory, and that was in a case called Bezelianski and, and Bezelianskaya in, in 2017. Uh, for whatever reason, that case wasn't cited to Mr Justice Mostyn when he made a, a decision in the case of SR and HR. Uh, 
where he was pretty categorical that effectively looking at delay in the uh, sale of a property was just not enough for him to revisit and set aside an order. And what he pointed out and what several uh, academic commentators have pointed out is the real difficulty and the tension with the Thwaite jurisdiction and, and the statutory factors are that under section 31, property adjustment orders and lump sum orders are not variable. A sale of property is generally an adjunct to one of those two capital orders. And so you have the immediate tension that whereas a sale of property order can be varied, the underlying orders are generally considered to be non-variable. Now, uh, Supreme Court made a comment, and it was very much an obit comment in Birch and Birch, on this issue. Uh, and they thought that trying to distinguish between the underlying order and the actual sale of property order was somewhat artificial and was probably a little bit too technical. Uh, and they took a fairly broad brush when they were considering in the context of undertakings in Birch and Birch that one could really look at the whole matter afresh. Uh, and in fact, they suggested, and I say no more than suggested because it was over to, that it was possible in those circumstances to effectively revisit the capital, the underlying capital order. Along comes uh, Mrs. Justice Roberts in a case called US and SR in 2018, and she has just a few months uh, earlier is faced with the decision of uh, Mr. Justice Mostyn in SR and HR. But she's looking at what the Court of Appeal has said, what Mr Justice Mumby has said in l and &L, looking at the context of undertakings. And she came very firmly to the view that she was able to effectively revisit the underlying capital order. So this wasn't a situation where there was a new event as such. This wasn't a situation where it was a timelessly made application because in fact, it was a very significant period of delay, I think four years or so of delay and effectively there had been a dramatic drop in in that case the russian property market which meant that the original intended outcome of the case was simply no longer possible if the original orders were allowed to stand uh, and mrs justice roberts had very little hesitation actually in the context of that case in proceeding to effectively rewrite the terms of her original capital decision effectively seeking to try and achieve roughly the same outcome but nevertheless it was quite clearly a revisit four years down the road of a capital order that she'd made. So there is clearly therefore a very significant uh, difference and one of the um, matters that I think does emerge from the authorities is if the court is willing to revisit the order it's only going to require it to do sort of significant change in circumstances. It, it doesn't require quite the high threshold that Barda imposes for the court to go along and set aside its, its own order. So it is going to be, I hope, in the context of what we're now currently facing, something that we all take into account when we're looking at the gamut of possible applications we can make uh, in light of what is going to or may or may not happen once we come out of the current uncertainty. So one of the interesting features, I think, Nikki, um, uh, about this is that if one goes back to Thwaite, um, it was originally uh, treated as a shield uh, and that um, the court um, would uh, not necessarily insist on the enforcement uh, of a, uh, an order which was executory. But if one then fasts forward to uh, Bezeliansky, um, it's clear in the Court of Appeal that it may be used both as a, uh, as a shield and a sword. So you may have a situation where um, a, a decision was made uh, perhaps a year or so ago on the basis of um, certain assumptions relating to uh, the valuation of, of a business, um, its future prospects and its future uh, liquidity in terms of the lump sum that was ordered to be paid. And those um, assumptions now are significantly um, altered in light of the crisis. Uh, and in those circumstances, it's not, it's not simply um, that somebody is um, being difficult and refusing um, in, a, um, in an awkward way to comply with an order. It may simply now not be possible to do so, given the, the, the wild change in circumstances we find ourselves in. Uh, and in those circumstances, it would be open um, for the person who is uh, required to make the, uh, the payments in those circumstances.
um, also to CK variation. I think I'm bound to say um, that uh, it is a jurisdiction which is not uh, significantly used. Um, I think it's also right to say that following the uh, 2008 crisis, where really BADA was the argument that was at the fore, and the courts were um, very much adopting a not opening the floodgates approach to litigation and limiting uh, the way in which BADA could be applied. So one sees uh, in the way in which you describe Nikki and um, that the route map that through which one might arrive at a, uh, a sensible argument for a variation. Um, but there will be counter arguments, no doubt, and there's bound to be some test cases um, in, in this area, I think. Andre, so, sorry, Andre, do you think that there is a, generally a requirement for there to be some sort of culpability on the party who is on the receiving end of such an application? Well, in the cases that are reported, you, you certainly see that as being a feature in quite a few of them, but um, the, the whole area around valuation that, um, or changes in value that the Reese has identified is, is quite a tricky one, isn't it? Because on the one hand, you've got those line of cases through Cornick and Cornick and Myerson and Myerson. I think Reese was thinking of, particularly when he was talking about the 2008 crash, where, which say that because a change in valuation is certainly a foreseeable risk in the future, that's not usually a ground for revisiting an order. But against that, you've got the very open-ended interpretation of the Thwaite jurisdiction, as in the Bezelianski and Bezelianskaya case from the Court of Appeal, um, which says that so long as it's executory as an order, it can, it can be varied. Um, so on those sorts of circumstances, just the fact that there's been a change in value of itself may be sufficient to exercise the jurisdiction, regardless of culpability. But I think in answer to your question, Nikki, I think it's certainly going to be easier to use in those cases where a party has been culpable for delay, which has resulted in a uh, a loss in value. So let's take an example of a case where a case was settled a year ago with an order for sale uh, because of one party's conduct. The property wasn't sold in the early part of this year when it could have been sold and uh, it's still unsold now following potentially a crash in the property market. And in those sorts of circumstances one can see how one, somebody may want to use the Thwaite jurisdiction uh, in order to avoid sharing in that loss which is not of their own uh, of their own making. So I think culpability may not necessarily be a formal ingredient in it, but it will certainly help uh, mount an, an argument in those cases where, where the facts give, uh, give some degree of, uh, uh, of argument in that direction. That's helpful, Andre. Nikki, what about um, maintenance? And if there's been a capitalization of maintenance, do you have any views there about um, the Thwaite jurisdiction? Well, I think that's going to be a very significant area if there has been a capitalization based upon somebody having a fairly reliable income and I say that in the context either of a business owner who's traded for many years and it looks fairly uh, secure in terms of the income stream coming forward and we may well have had one of those expert reports that tells us categorically and in fairly unequivocal terms that the maintainable income from this business for the uh, spouse is X and we've settled on that basis. That clearly in the current climate is going to be something which is going to be fairly unreliable going forward in most cases. Uh, we also have those cases where people have had a long track record of secure employment or a clear pattern even of self-employment. All of those sort of people are now facing, uh, through no fault of their own, certainly uh, taking away any question of culpability, but simply just as a result of the economic consequences of COVID-19, that the income that they have always felt confident is going to keep coming and have settled and capitalised on that basis may well no longer be quite so secure or, or may take some time to recover. And so, what, so in those circumstances, it seems to me that it may well be that sweat uh, is a significant change in the circumstances. Uh, and I think to apply the test that has started to emerge from the cases that, that uh, in this area, it's, it would be inequitable to hold somebody to a capitalization in the circumstances that are now going to be uh, going forward. Well, um, that's very interesting. Um, just wrapping up the discussion now, we've uh, mentioned uh, Thwaite and we've mentioned BADA. A discussion like this really wouldn't be complete without a very brief uh, mention of the barrel jurisdiction. Uh, I don't propose to go to it, into it in any uh, great depth at the moment. But if an order is yet to be sealed, so think of a, a case where perhaps you've had a decision made in the last few months and there's been some toing and froing 
over the uh, way in which the order is going to be drawn and it's yet to be sealed, there is a jurisdiction to go back to the court applying the barrel principles to ask the court to revisit its decision. Uh, so really Thwaite and Barda and Barrel, I think are three cases which we're all going to uh, become very more familiar with in the coming months.